Okay, this is a video about a completed uh, project finance model. Again, you could go to the uh, section with the uh, final project finance model exercises and uh, see how that works. So this is a toll road uh, model. Okay, and I have some uh, table of contents and we have a summary page. This is all kind of normal. You can uh, see what happens if you uh, look at a downside case. Hope uh, that worked. Let's put it back to the base case. I'm not going to see that work in just a minute. Uh, make sure that this is. Uh, <laughs> so, I was wondering about that. Uh, uh, so. We have a downside case, I hope. Uh, yes, the equity, I don't want to and all that. We're uh, still in a debt structuring mode. Um, you can change the uh, target DSCR and see what happens to the uh, uh, financing. We have some bond financing. We have some bank financing. We have a cash sweep. We put in a refinancing, this refinancing didn't work, we'd have to make it a, uh, stretch out the maturity a long time, okay, something like that, it still didn't work, we'd have to put in a higher uh, coverage ratio, and all that, okay, enough of that, let's take that uh, refinancing off, that didn't look so good anyway. Um, and then we have some uh, sources and uses. Should sound a little more exciting when I when I do this. Um, this I think will I'll use this one to illustrate some structuring aspects of the model. Since the the uh, the, the um, some numbers came from the red sheet, they're colored in red. The way that works is with as long as you've imported generic macros, you can go to this color color cells from tab color, uh, financing assumptions in a separate page, okay, operating assumptions include all the timing, some general economic assumptions, some traffic assumptions, some operating assumptions, and the way this model was structured was really just to illustrate some different ways where you can change the uh, growth rates, start with some vehicles, change the growth rates over time. Uh, change some expenditures in uh, maintenance expenditures, uh, change the uh, inflation scenario with a code number, all works with the index. So much of this uh, all works with the, uh, the index command uh, when you're making this scenario. So the uh, financing assumptions separate. Uh, some target DSCRs, what did we do with the interest rates, put some interest rates that, where the credit spread changes over time, some debt fees and some uh, financing assumptions, and then uh, some discount rates that change over time to make a valuation of the project. On the master scenario, the master scenario works with a two things three, four maybe. First you need absolutely to put a scenario number in. Everybody does that. Second, you use either choose command or the index. I almost always use the choose command in these kind of things. Third, uh, um, third you uh, s collect some outputs from the from the model, and then you make a, a data table. We don't really need our conditional formatting on this, so let's go to conditional formatting and clear the rules from the selected cell. I hope that works. Okay. So, and uh, then you, the fifth, fourth step is to make a data table, and in this data table, you set it up with the scenario numbers here. And then once you have the scenario numbers, uh, uh, you use that as the column input for the data table. You can make a, uh, a little sensitivity case, or a custom case, that allows you to use the little spinner buttons on one special case. These are all sensitivity cases. 
that just vary one single number, and you use that down here to get a, uh, a tornado diagram. And in this tornado diagram, we uh, 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 sorted it. So uh, hang on, let's just look at the tornado diagram. So that means the largest is on the top and the smallest is on the bottom. And to sort it, what I do is I use the uh, small uh, function. And uh, if we didn't have anything that's exactly the same, we don't. Have, you sometimes have to add some little rounding variable in case you have two numbers that have the identical value when you have the small uh, function. So let's look at the main sheet, and that's our uh, financing sheet. Uh, these colors on this true/false kind of suck, but all uh, right, we'll leave them. The way you start here, the way I started here, and you can start differently. We start with a uh, the the, the uh, hmm, start period. This is plus one. This is some EO month or E date. Doesn't really matter. Put the year function in, and this is really the key: is you figure out. G5. Where is G5? G5 is over here. Now that's green. It comes from the operating assumptions. And that's the total number of months you have prior uh, uh, to the, to the um, uh, COD, or in this case we call it the ROD, Road Operating Date, I guess. I don't know. Something like that. And then uh, you just add one, and when it goes, when this number becomes zero, that's the last period of the construction. When it becomes one, then it's the um, uh, uh, operation period. So, in that way, you can have the model switch between on a monthly basis in the construction and a, a, a six-month basis in the operation, which is a common way to do things. Now you can also, uh, what I do these days is keep the operations on a separate page and have them all be monthly and then convert them to be semi-annually. You could do everything monthly and accumulate things. Um, now, uh, uh, then we put in the traffic assumptions, and when we do put the traffic assumptions after we put all these true and false switches in, you can start the growth rates at different uh, periods. In this case, I assume we started the growth rate. This was uh, a, a lookup, and we had to look, use I. This is before I started using my lookup NA function. Okay, so we needed the long if error. Um, and this one is multiplied, I assume, by some kind of switch. L13, L13, no, we can't see L13. So that's some kind of operating phase switch. That's a common kind of thing. You put it on the toll rates, and again, uh, put some inflation in, and uh, see when uh, inflation begins. Okay. Uh, and what is this one? This one is this one times this one. And we put uh, L18. Uh, What's L18? L18 is the revenue inflation period. So we put a separate switch in for that. Using all the trying to make them all as transparent as possible. Uh, another one is you put in the operating expenses, uh, and for the operating expenses, you use some sort of switch and keep them separate per year. It looks like uh, there's a lookup uh, function. If you really, there's a whole uh, uh, exercise just explaining on how uh, how to. Uh, how to construct these. We put an S curve in using some kind of uh, distribution function, and then we've got our total capital expenditures uh, over the monthly uh, period. Once you get the CapEx, the revenues and expenses, you can compute the pre-tax cash flows, 
get some IRRs, then you can try to get the after-tax cash flows, and the after-tax cash flows have to take account of the depreciation. So that's our operating analysis. Once you've made the operating analysis, you go down and you begin the debt sizing, and in this, this time since we sized the debt using the uh, uh, debt service coverage ratio, we need to get the cash flow available for debt service. That, cal that implies a horrible circular reference. To get this, we need an interest rate, so we had to compute a periodic interest rate, and then we can figure out what the uh, present value of this uh, 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 CFADS is divided by the, the, this, the present value of this, I assume. The present value of this thing, which is the debt service that comes after the uh, start of the period, and you can uh, get how much the debt is using these different methods and uh, we had uh, different possible uh, debt structures you can see and then there's a whole refinancing thing so really that's the debt sizing you know uh, well, I suppose it's good the debt sizing here the next function the next part of the model has some uh, uh, f financing now the funding if you want to uh, uh, do the funding that's given the debt size so you do you kind of put a sources and uses together how much are we spending and then where are we getting the money and uh, hopefully uh, oh I put the sources and uh, we put us another sources and uses down here but really you put the funding in get the sources and uses and then you've got the uh, 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 debt balance and the debt balance you can then use this is the construction debt you use that to compute the fees <sighs> and the capitalized interest now there's there's circularity written all over this the reason you can get around the circularity a little bit is the is the uh, 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 when we put in the repayment function on the debt sizing. Where, where is the uh, repayment? This repayment. You see this has got a long uh, function now. There's a whole page on resolving the circular re circular references. This is the, without a doubt, doing this really carefully is the real challenge in a uh, project finance model. If you've got the if you're using the model instead of for sculpting, uh, uh, for structuring, if you're using it for risk analysis and everything's fixed, you have far, far less problems. If risk analysis means that you fix all the debt and we're just doing downside cases and all of that, okay? So debt structuring is very, very different than the uh, risk analysis. All right, let's go back to the debt balance. Now, once you have all the debt balance uh, worked out, then you can put in the debt service reserve account, which depends on uh, you need to uh, first compute the prospective debt service. And once you've got the prospective debt service, then you can see how much the debt service reserve account, how large it has to be. And the same thing kind of with the maintenance reserve. There are a lot of issues with the maintenance reserves. Some of those involve keeping the uh, uh, keeping not having a reserve account after the debt is finished and not building it up after you've got for a big maintenance period that might be afterwards and they can be structured all different ways. Now you need to add in depreciation and amortization on the fees separately from the depreciation you put up here where uh, you computed the after-tax cash flows. Okay, where was the after-tax cash? Here's the after-tax cash flows. Before the debt sizing, uh, we put in pre-tax cash flows opening balance sheet, closing balance sheet, depreciation rate, depreciation expense, net plant, EBIT, 
and somewhere there's the post tax IRA. I don't know why. I mean, it should have really been below here, but let's leave that. Even though this was a, supposed to be about really structuring a model, okay. And uh, so there's our uh, depreciation. Now, once you have that, finally you can compute the financial statements. The only real issue in the profit and loss statement is making sure you get the taxes correct. And sometimes you, uh, not sometimes, quite often you might have a net operating loss uh, account. Now that, there's a whole section on describing how to uh, make the NOL net operating loss uh, carry forward in, in the corporate. I actually put that in the corporate analysis because it's also used there. And then you make a cash flow waterfall. Now when you make a cash flow waterfall, some of these accounts should have minimum and max, min max, min max. No more min max. Okay. No more there. Okay. But that actually a whole lot of things. The, you need the minimum because you can only use so much or you can only borrow so much or you can only lose so much. You need the maximum to tell you whether it's a positive or a negative number. Finally, you can uh, compute some ratios and, and throw in a balance sheet to make sure everything works. Then you can throw th things on an annual statement, make an audit. There's our tornado diagram. This, I think this is worth going through. If you have a longer concession period, the NPV goes up. If you use the IRR as a metric instead, the reason this is taking so long is because uh, we've got a data table in here. You can see that the IRR didn't really change at all. The NPV changes a whole bunch, but the IRR doesn't change much. I, why I just did that. But you can see the problem with the data tables is they really slow things down. Um, what I hope that has in, in, up here, if you right click on that and press assign macro, there's a little calculate. So that says we have to, we're, uh, we have to recalculate everything uh, because the, otherwise the calculations are all uh, automatic except data tables if you have some of those. There's a whole section on data tables you can uh, then look at. Okay, we've been through that. Then there's a little debt repayment exercise that might be worthwhile. A little tax carry forward, a little circular exercise. A little exercise on computing the holding period to see uh, to see uh, where your uh, most profitable point for sale is. And, uh-oh. What happened to my last sale date? Well, I'm not going to worry about that right now. I'm just going to end the video.